The arrangements for the journey as far as Mount Sinai has been made for our travel by Mr. Rigoletin. A Bedouin was procured as guide who had been with M. Labor to Petra, and whose faith, as well as capacity, could be depended upon. The caravan consisted of eight camels and dromedaries, with three young Arabs as drivers. The tent was the common tent of the Egyptian soldiers bought at the government factory, being very light, easily carried and pitched. The bedding was a mattress and coverlet, provision, bread, biscuit, rice, macaroni, tea, coffee, dried apricots, oranges, a roasted leg of mutton, and two large skins containing the filtered water of the Nile. Thus equipped, the party struck immediately into the desert lying between Cairo and Suez. Reaching the latter place, with but little incident, after a journey of four days. At Suez, our traveler, weary with his experiment at the dromedary, made an, an attempt to hire a boat with the view of proceeding down the Red Sea to Tor, supposed to be the Elino, or place of palm trees mentioned in the Exodus of the Israelites. And only two days' journey from Mount Sinai. The boats, however, were all taken by pilgrims, and none could be procured, at least for so long a voyage. He accordingly went off, sent off his camels round the head of the gulf, and crossing himself by water, met them on the Petrion side of the sea. I am aware, says Mr. Stevens, that there is some dispute as to the precise spot where Moses crossed, but having no time for skepticism on such matters, I began to making up my mind that this was the place, and look around to see whether, according to the account given in the Bible, the face of the country and the natural landmarks did not sustain my opinion. I remember I looked up to the head of the gulf, where Suez, or Colson, now stands, and saw that almost to the very head of the gulf there was a high range of mountains, that which it would be necessary to cross, an undertaking which would have been physically impossible for 600,000 people, men, women, and children, to accomplish, with a hostile army pursuing them. At Suez, Moses could not have been hemmed in as he was. He could go off into the Syrian desert, or unless the sea had, was, had just greatly changed since that time, around the head of the Gulf. But here, directly opposite where I sat, was an opening in the mountains, making a clear passage from the desert to the shore of the sea. It is admitted from, that from the earliest history of the country, there was a caravan route from the Ramses of the Pharaohs to this spot. And it was perfectly clear to my mind that if the account be true at all, Moses had taken that route, that it was directly opposite of me. Between the two mountains where he'd come down with his multitude to the shore, and then it was there that he found himself hemmed in in the matter described in the Bible, with the sea before him and the army of Pharaoh in his rear. It was there he stretched out his hand and divided the waters. And probably on the very spot where I sat, the children of Israel had kneeled upon the sands to offer thanks to God for his miraculous interposition. The distance, too, was in confirmation of this opinion. It was about 20 miles across, the distance of which that immense multitude with their necessary baggage could have passed in the space of time by night mentioned in the Bible. Besides my own judgment and conclusions, I had authority on the spot in my Bedouin Tugleb, who talked of it with as much certainty as he had seated himself, and by the waning light of the moon, pointed out the meats and bounds, according to tradition, tradition received from his fathers. Mr. Stevens is here greatly in error, and he has placed himself in direct opposition to all authority on the subject. It is quite evident since the days of the miracle that 
but see has quote unquote greatly changed around the head of the gulf. It is now several feet lower as appears from the alluvial condition of several bitter lakes in the vicinity. On this topic, neighbor who examined the matter with his accustomed learning, acumen, and perseverance is indisputable authority. But he merely agrees with most of the able writers on his head. The passage occurred at Suez. The chief arguments sustaining this position are deduced from the ease by which the miracle could have been wrought on a sea so shaped by means of a strong wind blowing from the northeast. Resuming his journey to the southwest, southward, our traveler passed safely through a barren and mountainous region, bare of verdure and destitute of water, in about seven days to Mount Sinai. It is to be regret regretted that in his account of a country so little traversed in this, as this peninsula, Mr. Stevens has not entered more into detail upon his adventures at the Mount Holy Mountain, of which are of great interest. He dwells somewhat at length. At Akaba, he met the Sheikh as by agreement, a horse of the best breed of Arabia was provided. And although suffering from ill health, he proceeded manfully through the desert to Petra and Mount Hor. The difficulties of the route proved to be chiefly those arising from the rapacity of his friend, the Sheikh of Aqaba, who threw a thousand impediments in his way with the purpose of magnifying the importance of the service rendered and obtaining, in consequence, the larger allowance of bakshish. The account given of Petra agrees in all important particulars with those rendered by the very few travelers who had previously visited it. With these accounts, our readers are sufficiently acquainted. The singular character of the city, its vast antiquity, its utter loss for more than a thousand years to the eyes of the civilized world, and above all, the solemn denunciations of prophecy regarding it have combined to invest these ruins with an, an interest beyond that of any others in existence, and to render what has been written concerning them familiar knowledge to nearly every individual who reads. Leaving Petra as vis after visiting Mount Hor, Mr. Stevens returned to the Valley of El Gore and fell in into the caravan route for Gaza, which crosses the valley obliquely. Coming out of the ravine among the mountains to the westward, he here left the road to Gaza and imme pushed immediately on to Hebron. This distance between the Gaza route and Hebron is, we believe, the only positively new route accomplished by our American tourist. We understand that in 1826, Messrs. Strangeways and Anson passed over the ground on the Gaza road from Petra to the point where it deviates from for Hebron. On the part of Mr. Stevens's course, which we have thus designated as new, it is well known that a great public road existed in the later days of the Roman Empire, and that several cities were located immediately upon it. Mr. Stevens discovered some ruins, but a state of health unfortunately prevented a minute investigation. Those which he had encountered are represented as forming rude and shapeless masses. There were no columns, no blocks of marble, or other large stones indicating architectural or greatness. The penjitinger tables place Haluza in this immediate vicinity, and but for the character of the ruins seen, we might have supposed them to be remnants of that city. The latter part of our author's second volume is occupied with his journeys in the Holy Land, and principally with an account of his visit to Jerusalem. What relates to the Dead Sea we are induced to consider as upon the whole the most inter interesting, if not the most important portion of his book. It was his original intention to circumnavigate this lake, but for the difficulty of procuring a boat proved an obstacle not to be surmounted. 
He traversed, nevertheless, in a little extended shores, bathed in it, saw distinctly that the Jordan does mingle with its waters, and that birds floated upon it and flew over its surface. But it is time that we conclude. Mr. Stevens passed through the Samaria and Galilee, stopping at Nablus, the ancient Sychem, the burial place of the patriarch Joseph, and the ruins of Sebaste. Crossed the battle plain of Jezreel, ascended in Mount Tabor, visited Nazareth, the lake of Genesareth, the cities of Tiberias and Sephet, Mount Carmel, Acre, Sour, and Sidon. At Beirut, he took passage for Alexandria and thus finally returned to Europe. The volumes are written in general with a freedom of frankness and an utter absence of pretension, which will secure them the respect and goodwill of all parties. The author professes to have compiled his narrative merely from quote unquote brief notes and recollections, admitting that he has probably fallen in errors regarding facts and impressions, errors which he has prevented from seeking out and correctly correcting by the urgency of other occupations since his return. We have, therefore, thought it quite well as not to trouble our readers in this cursory review. With references to parallel travels, now familiar with those merits and demerits, are sufficiently well understood. We take leave of Mr. Stevens with sentiments of hearty respect. We hope it is not the last time we shall hear from him. He's a traveler who is not, with whom we shall like to take other journeys. Equally free from the exaggerated sentimentality of Chateaubriand or the supplemented the too French enthusiasm of Lamartine on the one hand, and on the other from the degrading spirit of utilitarianism which sees in mountains and waterfalls only quarries and manufacturing sites. Mr. Stevens writes like a good man, good sense and sound feeling, 